If you haven't already done so, make sure you have your <clears throat> earphones handy. You'll want them for Michael's session. And without further ado, I will just kick it over to you, Michael. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, so uh, thanks everybody for having me out today. This is the latest in what I think is like an ongoing series of how to's for uh, the planetarium world through Lyft. So um, uh, of course, my name is Michael McConville. You might remember me from such uh, past LIPS presentations as Explain Like I'm Five, Public Relations for the Planetarium, and Fundamentals of Data Visualization. And today, uh, we're going to uh, try something a little different, and that is fully taking advantage of the um, sound side of Zoom, not uh, just the visuals. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for everybody. And uh, this is, oh, let's make sure everything's good. All right, so you should be seeing a, uh, you should be seeing my, uh, my PowerPoint screen now. Uh, and what, if you have the ability to do so, I think up in the upper left corner of your Zoom window, you should have the ability to turn on original sound if you have that option available. If not, no worries, it's not gonna be an issue. Uh, but when the this PowerPoint goes live uh, later on after LIPS, all of the audio that we're using during this presentation is embedded in the PowerPoint. And so you can click through and listen with whatever uh, uh, speakers or headphones you have available. Uh, because this is more of a how-to and we're listening things uh, to things together, it's also an opportunity for all of you to um, interrupt at any time. Really, that's the whole point. There's a lot of things that we're gonna be discussing and they may not make much sense 10 minutes down the line. So if there's a question that you have, I've got the chat window open and we'll be able to follow that. But go on ahead and you know raise digital hands or unmute yourself and ask questions. It's not a problem. Uh, as most of you know, uh, being interrupted is, is not an issue. It's uh, I, I'm kind of unflappable in these situations. I've had much worse happen to me than fellow colleagues interrupt me in the middle of a presentation. So we should enable original sound? If you have that, yes. And okay. so what that will give you the, the ability to do through Zoom is to listen uh, through your, your earphones with the same fidelity as what my computer is producing. And because some of the things we're going to listen to today are actually fairly subtle, having any additional uh, fidelity available to you is a good thing. If not, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll discuss it and, and, uh, uh, and give as much context as possible so that you're, you're ready for it. But this is Hear Ye, Hear Ye, all about sound in your dome. And there's uh, quite a bit for us to go over today, and I'm really excited. This was, a, this was an interesting uh, presentation to put together. Um, and I believe the final count uh, for animated GIFs was nine. So if you've seen any of my previous IPS presentations, uh, we're raising the bar every time we give a presentation. So here's an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, sort of the components that make up the sound process. And the first, perhaps the most important part of the sound process is you. Uh, unless you are a Dave Weinrich or a Mark Breen, you are almost certainly going to be the weakest link in your audio. And so being able to get yourself into a, uh, a place where you feel comfortable delivering that's going to make the rest of the sound process work even better. Then we work out into microphones, the enhancements that you might be able to do to live sound in your planetarium. These would be things like equalization and effects and, and the like. We'll talk about the mix, how to use your mixer and set levels and be able to, to generate the most signal and minimize the noise to get the best sound in your planetarium. And then finally about the speakers and the dome itself. All together, these are the differences between a good planetarium show and a great planetarium show. And the reason that, uh, you know, I, I wanted to do this in the first place is, you know, I, I've been in plenty of conferences, other planetariums, my own planetarium, uh, and I think many of you have as well, where the visuals are amazing and everything looks so crisp and clear and colorful on the dome. And then our presenter gets up and turns on their microphone and it sounds like they're giving a presentation from the bottom of an ocean or at the end of a cardboard tube. It just sounds terrible. And it really does detract from the entire experience of being in a planetarium and enjoying the, uh, 
uh, the, the, the presentation. And so while we spend a lot of time, and rightfully so, on how to make our shows as live and interactive as possible, there is only so much mental processing power our audiences have. And if they spend any of that trying to figure out what we're saying because they can't hear us correctly, we're going to do them a disservice, and that's going to detract from what we're really trying to do, which is give them the best planetarium show that we possibly can. So that's really what today is all about, uh, just getting everybody uh, to a common knowledge base about how sound works and, and how all of these different aspects of the sound process work together in planetariums. So the very first part, most important thing is you. You are the person that makes all of this worthwhile in the first place. And to sound your best, uh, I've got a couple of, of tips that I, I think will be uh, uh, of use for us to remember. Take your time. Embrace the silence. There's something about being in a planetarium where getting into a right cadence and delivering your presentation, you're rehearsing it, you're working through it, you're modulating your volume and your pitch, the speed by which you deliver things changes. You've, you've created this very dynamic soundscape that your audiences get to actively participate in. And sometimes when you just let things settle into place, when there isn't uh, your talking over the soundtrack, for example, we all know that that can be a pretty magical experience when the visuals and the sound and, and, and the music combine together into this really unique place. The other thing is, of course, we're all used to working in the dark. Um, the vast majority of us are going to give planetarium presentations in the dark. And oftentimes you can tell the mood of a person just by listening to them. And, you know, are they standing there? Are they seated? Are they hunched over? Are they gesticulating and gesturing while they're doing this? Are they smiling while they're giving a presentation? Remember that your nonverbal cues that in uh, standard communication actually tell a lot about what's happening. Those cues can be telegraphed while you are in the dark as well. So to sound your best, do in fact feel like somebody is in the room watching you. So, you know, if you're, you know, say you were a radio host and you're talking to hundreds of thousands or millions of people out there on the, on the radio waves and you're the only person in the room, you want to act like somebody's watching you, like you're having a conversation with someone in the room and how much that transforms the entire vocal performance. And then the one that, that, that seems counterintuitive is always project, especially when you have a microphone, not when you don't have one. Uh, we, we've, we've all met that person. Uh, usually they'll state after, oh, I'm loud enough for everybody to hear me. They'll then follow that with, I'm from Texas. Uh, that has happened to me on more than one occasion where a Texan has had to tell me that they are in fact loud enough to be heard in a planetarium. You never assume that it's an accessibility thing. Always assume that no one in the dome can hear you. And when you project with a microphone, what you're able to do is then set up the microphone in a way where you maximize the amount of signal that you're generating as the speaker while minimizing the amount of noise that that microphone or your audio system is going to pick up. And that means better quality audio and it means that you're now more engaged. You are reaching for the front of the dome if you're, say, at the console in the back. You're reaching the back row if you're up in front giving the presentation. Just remember that what you do physically is going to have a major effect on how sound is produced and how that sound is going to be um, experienced by your audience. Pretty common sense stuff and none, nothing here that we're actually having to listen to. But need to get it out of the way. You are the important part, the most important part in your sound chain. Take advantage of that. Um, Martin Radcliffe, back when he was in, in, in Wichita, um, would have himself and, and other members of the team take vocal lessons to be able to get themselves in the right mindset to be able to produce the best possible sound when presenting. So if you've got that opportunity, if you're working at a college or a university, maybe you have a performing arts uh, division of, of your school or, or you know, a, a theater or opera 
uh, that's connected to your cultural venues, hey, try to take advantage of some of the professional development that they do as well. It'll help you out. But now to the part where we really get into the sound and we get to like play things and you get to hear it through the headphones. You're talking, something needs to pick that up. That something is going to be your microphone. And uh, for some of you, this might be uh, sort of a refresher course of um, the different technologies. For some of you, this is like the first time we've really been able to break it down into, oh, there are multiple different kinds of mics and they do have different use cases. And that's really the knowledge base we wanna set up today. So let's start off with some microphone basics. There are uh, quite a number of variety of microphones, most of which can have some very, very specific use cases. But for uh, those of us in the planetarium world, we are likely to run into one of three major microphone categories. Uh, there are dynamic microphones, condenser microphones, and the rarer and usually quite expensive ribbon microphones. Uh, Ribbon microphones are among the, the oldest type. It's actually got a, a small piece of, um, a small diaphragm piece of metal that vibrates and picks up things like not just the pressure of your sound waves hitting it, uh, but also the speed. And that gives it this very, very nuanced sound. If you want to think about uh, the radio sound of the 1930s and the 1940s, much of that was because of ribbon microphones and uh, tube-based amplifiers. Most planetariums do not have $1,000 ribbon microphones for everyday use. They don't have $10,000 tube preamps sitting in your rack somewhere. What we're more familiar with are the dynamic and condenser microphones. So dynamic microphones do not require additional power. Um, and what you're seeing here is probably the most famous dynamic microphone in the world is the Shure SM58. You probably don't know the name, but you certainly know the look. This has been on probably every major stage, every major arena, from, the, from Wembley and Rose Bowl all the way down to the dingiest dive bar. Singers have been working with these dynamic microphones for decades. And the reason is really simple. They're sturdy, they're reliable, and they sound really, really good. They have a frequency response that's very much suited to vocals. They have a little bit of boost in the high frequencies that makes it sound really great. And they cut the low frequencies where things don't sound muddy. And now you get to see the magic of the PowerPoint. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the picture and you'll hear an example of what a dynamic microphone is supposed to sound like. So here we go. This is an example of a dynamic microphone, billions and billions of stars. Okay, good. So you should have heard something about a dynamic microphone and billions and billions of stars. Uh, so dynamic microphones tend to be pretty straightforward. Um, they're not terribly warm. This is not like a, a, a radio microphone, if you will. It's not something you'd use for broadcast, but if you're using it for live sound, uh, a dynamic mic like this is gonna work really, really well. In this case, you plug it directly into the mixer, no power necessary, and it's gonna work really well. The second type is the condenser microphone. And instead of utilizing, um, uh, instead of utilizing a, a moving coil, um, dynamics are using this, this magnetic moving coil. What, what the, di the condenser mics are doing is actually using a conductive diaphragm. And that's gonna pick up a lot more nuance and have a much higher fidelity of sound than a dynamic microphone would. That means they're gonna sound warmer, they're gonna sound bigger, uh, and if you're doing vocal work, for example, condenser microphones would be the ones you would want to use most often. So if you have a, a headset or a lavalier, you know, a, 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 a clip-on mic, the more expensive varieties of those are going to have very, very small condenser microphones inside of them, and that's what's going to give them a better sound. So we heard the dynamic, now we can listen to the condenser. This is an example of a condenser microphone billions and billions of stars. And so if you were to compare those two, the condenser is going to feel a little warmer. It's going to have a little bit more bass. There's a bit more to it all. The important fact for a condenser is that it requires power to operate. And in some cases, in the olden days, you might have a, an, an external uh, microphone uh, uh, 
power supply. And in much more recent years, what we've been able to do is uh, a microphone cable can, can transmit uh, 48 volts of power through a mixer into the microphone. So there's usually a little button on the mixer you might have in your dome that says 48V. And if you press that, that's going to allow a condenser microphone to work properly. If you, uh, if you plug in a condenser mic and you don't hear anything and you're moving all of the knobs and nothing works and the 48 volt is off, that will explain the issue about why you're not getting any sound. Uh, Jeff, there's a lot of reasons why you would hate lavaliers. We'll get to why in just a bit. But the, the, the biggest reason, of course, is that when you have three different types of microphones, these base ones, dynamic and condenser, the ones most likely to be found in a planetarium, you also have microphones that can be dynamic, they can be condenser, but they can also have specific pickup patterns. And this is simply how the microphone experiences sound in the environment. Uh, so we'll, we'll take that away and put up the, uh, the names here. What's important is you want to be in the place where there's a thick white line. So if you look at the Omni, that's omnidirectional, a microphone that picks up sound from all directions. And to give you a sense of where this is going to be, this is looking down onto the top of a microphone. So if you're standing directly above the microphone and it's omnidirectional, all around that microphone, you're gonna pick up sound. So if you wanna put an Omni mic in the middle of a desk during a conference, then everyone around that table is gonna be able to be heard because it's picking up sound equally in all different directions. That might be good when you have a lot of people. That might be good if you're trying to pick up sound from a choir. It's not good if you're trying to give a presentation because not only will it pick up your audio, but it's gonna pick up the audio against your shirt. It's gonna pick up the audio that's coming from the rest of the room. And that's going to raise the noise floor, the amount of stuff you're fighting against. Omnidirectional might not be the way to go. Then you have mics that are bi-directional which means that in front and behind the mic, you can pick up a lot of, of audio, but on the sides, that audio is rejected. It cannot pick those up. This allows a little bit more control over the audio space. Wherever you might be, you're in an office, you're in your planetarium, you're at home, now you know that if you're in front of it or behind it, that's where the sound's gonna be picked up, but not on the side. So if you're using, uh, say for example, like a, 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 you've got a, a set of earbuds and they've got an inline microphone in them, usually those are gonna be bi-directional. They're gonna pick it up on either side. And if you move that ever so slightly, you can find yourself in the spot where there isn't any, uh, um, isn't any audio pickup at all. And then most of the microphones that we would use in the planetarium, whether it's a headset or a handheld, are gonna be uh, a version of what are known as the cardioids. And this allows for even more directed audio pickup. Uh, so you can see in the upper right, we have the basic cardioid, uh, kind of looks like a, a summer ham of sorts. Uh, there's the super cardioid, which shrinks it down a little more. There's the hyper cardioid, which shrinks it down even more so. And then when you eventually get it to where it's only in one direction and you're pretty much rejecting all audio from the sides, that's where you end up with a shotgun mic. And so if you've ever seen the, the, the boom mics on a, on a film set, those are shotgun mics. They're meant to be able to be kept away and out of the scene, but be so directional that as long as you're pointing at the person speaking, you're gonna be able to pick up their audio regardless of the outside noise. So in most cases, we're working with cardioid uh, microphone patterns. And that's gonna reject a lot of the sound that's around you and direct that uh, pickup towards your, your, your speech, towards your voice. And that means that we can reject a lot of the sound around us while only getting what we need. Any questions on that before we, we move on? John. Um, so that means when you pick up your mic with a cylindrical handhold, it matters how you're holding it. Usually with, with a, uh, a handheld, that's going to be a cardioid in such a way that the handle itself is where it's rejected. And so everything around that is good. And that's why in most cases, you can handhold a mic 
keep it there and not get a lot of noise from you holding it. It's when you start fumbling it around or you hit the top of it where you get a lot of that extra noise, but they're designed in such a way that that, that, that peak in the back where you don't see anything, that's where the handle is going to be 99% of the time. And uh, so, you know, in most cases, this is not something you're going to have to actively think about unless you're in a very specific use case. General rule of thumb is that if you're using a handheld mic, it's going to have some sort of cardioid pickup pattern. And that's good. That's what you want in these sorts of situations. Then we get to the proximity effect. Uh, if, for those of you who are fans of Saturday Night Live, you may recognize the uh, sweaty balls um, uh, uh, skit. Uh, Alec Baldwin, of course, comes in later. And, and one of the, the kind of the underlying jokes about that is the NPR sound that if you are uh, Terry Gross, for example, you lean into the microphone, everything gets really bassy, and we feel like we're really close and intimate together. That is the proximity effect in effect. It is a useful thing, but many times when you're in a planetarium, you have sound systems that could be thousands of watts of power, and that much bass is going to muddy up everything. So let's take a let's take a quick listen. This is what the proximity effect sounds like when you are close to the mic. This is an example of the proximity effect at close range to the microphone. Okay, very bassy, very close. That was about an inch away. Now let's see what the proximity effect is like if you step back. This gets us about eight to 12 inches from the standard microphone. This is an example of the proximity effect more distant from the microphone. So same exact setup, same exact microphone, but with the proximity effect very close, you have a very bassy sound. Step away from that, the proximity effect goes away. And on a directional microphone like the ones we're using, that bass frequency is going to trail off, and now you have a more balanced tone. So this is one of the things where if you're finding that no matter what you do in the planetarium, it's just really, really booming. You've got a lot of bass and there's not much that you can do to get rid of that, uh, that basiness, simply moving the mic further away from you, holding the mic further away, even moving it off of the center line, not in front of your face directly, but off to the side or maybe down a little bit, that's going to get rid of a lot of that base. And now your proximity effect uh, is, uh, is going to be uh, attenuated. And Carissa, at some point, I think an ASMR channel would actually be a lot of fun. One other thing we're pretty much used to uh, is, uh, especially in the English language, the way that 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 letters are are created, the way that our our mouths have to be shaped, the interaction of your teeth and your tongue and your cheeks and all of that together, mean that for six letters in our alphabet, uh, we have what are known as plosives and sibilants. Plosives are what they sound like, things that have a, a, a percussive nature to it. Those would be p, t, and k. So those you do not have to voice. Those are made by your mouth itself. Then there are b, d, and g. Those are voiced plosives. And those six letters pretty much make up the six letters that will mess up any sort of, of audio recording. Then there's number seven, that's the letter S, and that is in, in and of itself a whole other issue. That's where sibilance comes in, it's the s. It's why when you go and you say, um, Sally sells seashells by the seashore, why that's a tongue twister is because of how much your, uh, how much the tongue is involved in that, and that sibilance can slip through and cause major issues for listeners, especially when you're close to a microphone. So what, we generally will do in, in audio engineering is to introduce a pop filter. Uh, you can buy them or you can make them. In the olden days, this would be a wire hanger and a pair of pantyhose and you would stretch it over. And as long as you have a, a, uh, uh, a, a barrier between you and the microphone that prevents direct wind on the microphone itself, that's going to minimize a lot of these pl and s sounds. You could do this uh, as part of effect enhancements. You could go into a, 
uh, a program and actually DS your sounds, or in a live setting, this would simply be, well, I'm, as I'm, my computer is flying away, a windscreen. So this would be, uh, uh, <laughs> I know we're in a room of, of a, a fair number of cat lovers, uh, myself included, um, in, in film, this would be known as a dead cat. And so you get this very fluffy sock that fits over the microphone and it prevents a lot of wind noises. Uh, so let's hear what that sounds like with and without the pop filter. Here we go. This is an example of plosives and sibilants without a pop filter. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers, Peter Piper picked. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. So lots of P's, lots of S's. And when you're listening closely, what you're hearing is a lot of p, p, p. The louder that is, the more of an issue that can become to a listener. If, if you're in a dome and you've got, you know, P's that are hitting at these low frequencies and that's coming through your subwoofer, that's going to get annoying really quick. That also muddies up your sound. So let's hear what it's like with a pop filter in place. This is an example of plosives and sibilants with a pop filter. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers, Peter Piper picked. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. So it's not a massive difference, but if you're going to be talking in a planetarium for 20 or 30 minutes straight, even if it's a live and interactive show, you know that there's going to be uh, a vast majority of the speaking time is going to fall on you as the presenter. Anything that you can do to sort of minimize the number of plosives and the amount of sibilance that you have in your sound, it's going to be a positive thing. So windscreens, pop filters, absolutely the way to go. Um, usually windscreens are going to come with all of your microphones. And if they don't, you can pick them up on Amazon. It's like a dozen for 10 bucks. They slide right on. Uh, and most importantly, they will protect the microphone itself. Because as we all know, you get a microphone close to you, there's a lot of P's and S's and there's things, but there's also spit. Like there's the moisture of being a human being and transferring that to a microphone. The windscreens help to prevent that. If they get a little grody, you rip it off, you throw it away, and you replace it with a new one, and it costs you a dollar. So keep that in mind. Be practical about these things, uh, and it works out pretty easily. And then there is mic etiquette. Um, and this is pretty much where this entire presentation stemmed from, was people eating the microphone. Like, it's not an ice cream cone. It's not that turkey leg that you get at Walt Disney World. It is a microphone. Don't eat it. Just use it. Um, and to make sure that you always remember this, let's get a, let's get a, a GIF in here. Um, don't do what this individual is going to do and eat the mic. Uh, that just, that's how you get bad sound. And so if you're further away, things are better. If it's too close, then you really have uh, really limited yourself in the amount of, of uh, uh, fixing that you're able to do uh, with your mixer and with all of the other sounds. So don't eat the mic. If you take nothing away from this presentation, it is don't eat the mic. That's it. That's all. Know what the usage and the microphone, how those two things are going to interact with each other. Uh, lavalier mics, the clip-on mics, um, you may know them as a lapel mic. That would be the, the other major use. Um, those are not great for planetarium use. And I'm just going to throw it out there to all of you, kind of think about this in a practical sense. Why would a lapel mic not be an appropriate mic for planetarium use? Because you, thank you, Micah. I like, I knew it. I was looking at you and I got it. Exactly. It stays there and you look up. I mean, that's what we do. We've been told to keep looking up for decades at this point. And if you've got a lapel mic, you can't do that effectively. A handheld mic, you've got a little bit more control over that, but you've also got to remember to keep the mic in line with where you are. It has to go with you. If it doesn't, you're going to have uh, very drastic changes in your sound quality. So that's why my recommendation would be is if you have the ability to do so, if you've got the means in your planetarium to do so, using a headset is the right way to go. Having a microphone that's that close to your mouth, 
that is always going to move with you. And of course, the new ones now are very, very low profile. Uh, they don't stand out and they look pretty cool. Like 20 years ago, it would have been the Britney Spears look. And now it's just like, okay, this is expected. You're in the dark, nobody cares whether or not you've got a massive microphone on your face or a really tiny one, as long as you sound good, that's what's more important. Um, none of us got in the planetarium field because we were cool. And I, I know that's shocking to many of you, but like we're, we're here for the people. So match that use. If you're sitting in front of a desk, um, say for example, uh, this was, um, say this was our next session and, and Mike is in a planetarium giving a presentation and he's at the console with open space, what might end up happening is that you're, you're, you're at the computer far more often. There's a lot less movement because you're trying to control the system. That could be an opportunity, say you have a script as well, that could be an opportunity to have uh, one of these bigger condenser mics on a tripod or an arm so that you have that microphone in front of you and you can really get a much better sound. But if you're out there and you're moving around and you're being dynamic and it's a very, very live and interactive show where maybe you're with the students in the planetarium, that handheld, uh, that wireless mic is gonna be much more useful for you. Keeps your, your, your hands free to operate the system, to interact the whole deal. Uh, almost certainly the best way to go. And like we were talking about with proximity effect, when you're using a handheld mic, the instinct is to keep it right in front of your face. And you know, you've been to a concert where the, the, the singer's holding onto the microphone like this and it's just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. We don't want that. What's usually the good thing to do is to get off that center line. Like if you think about a line coming out from your chin, you want to be below that and to either side. Those microphones are sensitive. They can pick up your voice really, really well. And that means that moving it off to the side and keeping it below your, uh, your um, projection is going to give you better sound. So let's take a listen to that right now. This is an example of a dynamic microphone directly in front of the speaker. This is an example of a dynamic microphone placed below and to the left of the speaker. So if you have sort of larger headphones, if you're not maybe using earbuds like I am, one of the things that absolutely would have jumped out is how much less bass and how much more balanced the second half of that audio sounds because it's down and to the left. So I'm holding it here and, you know, one of the, 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 real kind of best practices, watch a stand-up comedian with a handheld mic. They'll never hold it in front of their face. What they're usually gonna do is hold it down sort of at chest level so that it's sitting below their chin. And that allows them to go loud and soft. It allows them to move and gesture and really get into it, but keep a very consistent audio profile throughout their show. And especially if it's, you know, it was, if it was an HBO special back in the day or now a Netflix special, that audio is the key component of the whole thing. Doesn't matter how good they look on stage. If you can't hear, you know, John Mulaney, there's no comedy special. And so being able to have good mic etiquette, to have good mic um, uh, uh, usage is, is going to be like instrumental to the best possible sound. So as we're kind of finishing out microphones, any questions there before we move on and, and get to the, uh, uh, the next part of our, our sound process? Michael? Yes, sir. Uh, one thing occurred to me there, you've re referred a couple of times to how the bass, it's easy to get too much bass under certain circumstances. Well, that makes me think about what's the difference between male and female voices, and are there are there things to consider, uh, you know, in that in differences? There are differences, uh, presumably. It, Alan, it is almost as if I sent you the script, and you segued us perfectly into the next part of the presentation. Well, you're welcome. Because that's all about uh, enhancements, and in this case, the most important enhancement to your sound is through equalization. And this was the part uh, when I was putting the, the, the presentation together that worried me the most was how do you make a frequency response graph interesting? So here we go. We're gonna make it with color. So in an equalization, uh, in a frequency response graph, uh, it is, um, 
basically it's logarithmic. So you can see there at the bottom, it goes from 10 Hertz up to 100, and then it condenses. It goes from 100 to 1,000, 1K, and then from 1K to 20K. Uh, and of course, Hertz, the wavelength of a sound wave, uh, the typical human ear has a frequency range of 20 Hertz on the low end to about 20,000 Hertz on the high end. Anything over about 16,000 Hertz is pretty much dog whistle at that point. It, it, in, in many cases, it hurts to listen to. And as we age, uh, men more so than women, the first part of the frequency response that goes is the highest frequencies. So if you've ever wondered why old men always seem to be kind of crotchety when listening to women's voices, like they can't hear it, there's a reason for that. Part of it is probably because they're jerks. But the other reason is, since women's voices are generally higher in frequency than male voices, they are more difficult to hear if you have a limited high frequency response. Fun, fun stuff here. Uh, on the other side, anything under about 30 hertz is uh, you're going to feel far more than you'll hear. So you can feel two, three, four hertz. Um, that's, that's extremely low uh, frequency. You may not hear it, but you will feel it because that's a lot of air that's moving quite slowly. For the most case, if you are uh, using a microphone in a live setting, and especially if it's a vocal one, Anything under about 85 hertz is completely useless. All it does is muddy up the sound. Even the bassiest of male voices, like I can't even get to Mark Breen depths, but to get to the Breen depths, uh, nowhere near 85 hertz. And so what we would usually do in a mixing setting when we're looking at an equalizer is to try to roll off uh, or attenuate as much of these low frequencies as possible. And one of the ways to do that is through what's known as a high pass filter. It lets all the frequencies above a certain point through, that's usually about 100 hertz, and everything else is going to be rolled off so that that doesn't muddy up your sound. Let's take a listen. This is an example of speech without a high pass filter in place. This is an example of speech with a high pass filter in place. Very subtle but you'll notice a little bit less bass on that second half, and that's gonna make it a lot cleaner and a lot easier for us to use. Your headphones are not the 18 inch subwoofers that might be sitting behind your dome, and that's gonna be accentuated even more if we do not cut those low frequencies. So as you can tell, this part of the, the frequency response graph is in red. Just forget about it, don't worry about it. We don't need these for vocals. Then we have really what is the foundation of most voices, and this is male and female. It's between 100 and 300 hertz. This is where we don't want to mess with equalization too much. If you cut or boost frequencies in this range, it can make the human voice sound artificial. And so if you wanted to have a robotic voice or if you wanted to make it just a little bit uncanny valley, this is where a lot of those frequencies are going to lie. This is the foundation of almost all human speech. At the very far end, in the upper registers of the frequencies, is the region between four and 6,000 hertz. This is really far up there. It's the presence. And this is where, if you boost frequencies, audio, especially vocals, tend to sound really nice. This is a part of the audio spectrum that human ears love. We really like clarity in the four to 6,000 hertz range. And many microphones by design will have a little boost in this area of the frequency chart to be able to make them sound better. Our ears hear presence or boosts in this part of the frequencies, and we associate that with clarity and sharpness. So these are things that would be good. I have a lot of, of, um, of, uh, you know, a, a, an ability to cut through other sounds. This is also why when you think about um, high octave singers, you think about, a, uh, you know, an opera singer who's male, a lot of that is based off of power, not off of pitch, not how high can you go, but 
if you think about a, 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 a soprano or you know somebody like a Mariah Carey, where they can go extremely high in their singing range, that's going to move them into this part of the frequency range, and that stands out as a very distinct uh, uh, sound compared to what most of us would be used to. And so that's why the like a, a soprano singer tends to resonate a little bit better because they have a lot of response in this upper frequency range. So these are the two ones we want to really focus on. The ones in yellow are the ones we want to be kind of, you know, we got to be, we got to be careful with. Between 300 and 650, that's where you get a lot of the p and s. So if you're having issue there, maybe you bring down the, the, the equalization in this area. If you make changes between 1000 and 3500 hertz, this is where nasal frequencies tend to resonate. So this is the resonant frequency of your nasal cavity. And if you are from, I don't know, the great state of Massachusetts, where seemingly everyone resonates in about this exact part of the frequency scale, um, this is where if you have a, sort of a stuffiness, this is where you might fix the, the sound to be able to take some of that nasalness away. And at the very highest end, the sibilance is at the highest end of your, your audio. That's the, it might be a low sound to you, but those S sounds are going to be much, much higher on the frequency range. And those are things we have to keep in mind when we're equalizing. For the most part, this is going to be something where you have a high, a mid, and a low. The low allows you to control your bass. The high is going to give you the ability to give you a little bit of sheen, a little bit of presence. And the middle is where you really get to tune in the human voice. Mid frequencies are the ones that are most uh, important when trying to equalize the human voice. So oh, fun stuff there. Uh, and now we get into compression. So this, uh, as an effect, whether in live settings or in recorded ones, Compression is one of the most powerful tools in the audio toolbox. Uh, it's the reason why when you're watching, so for those of you who are too young to know, there was a time when you watched TV and in between parts of the show, there were commercials. And you couldn't just skip them or just run away. But one of the things that, that has always been an issue is like, why is the commercial so much louder than what's going on during the show? And that's because in most cases, the way that, commercials are mixed down is that they are heavily compressed so that the difference between the highest and the lowest parts of an audio track are much closer to each other than they would be otherwise. And so the louds are a little bit softer, but the softer parts are a lot louder. And that means that when you compress something, you can make it louder without it distorting. The more you compress, the louder you can push it without it distorting uh, an audio source. So when you work through your compression, um, you'll see that there are gonna be certain aspects of it. What threshold, at what point do I say, this is too loud and I want to start bringing and compressing it back down? The knee is how we get there. Is it, do I get to a certain point, it stops, and then now I've cut it, I've cut it? Or is it sort of rounded? Do I transition into this compression? We can talk about attack and release. How quickly is something compressed? How quickly is that compression released? And then what's our ratio? How uh, much as I go above my threshold are things going to be fixed? Explaining this is not the easiest thing. The, the basic idea is that compression is pressure. And when you're under pressure, you have a, a change in the tone of the audio. So what we've done, I've got three different ones here, one of no compression, one of light compression, and then one of heavy compression. And you'll very clearly be able to tell the difference between all three. So here we go, here's no compression. I'm a globular cluster. You will not be able to control yourself in the planetarium. I'm angry because I'm hot. Okay. So you may have recognized some of that from the, the famous little star that could. And in there we have some very high and loud portions, and then we have a middle portion that's a little bit quieter. And the compression is gonna be able to equalize that and bring all of that audio into alignment with one another. So what you're gonna hear, when they say compression, it will sound as if this audio is being compressed. So you heard the new one, now the light compression. 
I'm a globular cluster. You will not be able to control yourself in the planetarium. I'm angry because I'm and hot. Heavy. I'm a globular cluster. You will not be able to control yourself in the planetarium. I'm angry because I'm hot. So you'll notice with heavy compression, the beginning and the end were much quieter than they were in the first one with no compression because the, that effect is bringing the audio levels down and up simultaneously. And this is useful in vocal settings if you have a presenter who goes from very loud to very soft and back up to very loud over the course of a show and maybe you don't want to blow out your speakers maybe you don't want to freak out the the second grader in the third row and the compression allows you to get the, the highest points to be a little lower the lowest points to be a little bit higher and you have a more uh, consistent audio throughout the performance so compressors can do this live or in this case they can do that in a recorded setting and so the heavy compression has a has a high threshold and a big ratio the light compression that threshold is going to be a little higher it's going to let a little more through and the ratio the amount that's actually going to be compressed again going to be a little bit lower then there's reverbs and delays and these are you know if you want to change how a space sounds you all know and 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 it's it's one of these sort of instinctual things of being around you all know what a shower sounds like you can think about what audio that would be recorded in a shower or something with a lot of very reflective surfaces you know instinctually what that sounds like you know what it would sound like if you were in a cathedral you know what sound is going to be like if you're in a closet and that's because of reverb the natural um ambiance of a uh, of a location and so we can incorporate that into our live sound if you want to accentuate if you want your dome to sound bigger or if you want your dome to sound smaller and this is a really really useful tool for changing sort of the 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 auditory intimacy of your space and so if you've got some sort of effects in you know, a portable dome where you're not going to get a lot of reverb, you're not going to get a lot of echo, this is a really, really good opportunity to kind of make it sound like it's a much bigger space. So there are a few things that go into that. Your decay time is basically how long it takes for this reverb, this echo to stop. The mix is how much of the original and how much of this uh, reverbed sound is mixed together. Uh, in, in audio terminology, it's wetness. I didn't choose it. Uh, and then pre-delay is when does the reverb start? If it starts immediately, it might sound like you're in a huge space. If you let it delay just a little bit, that's going to give some more clarity to what you might be hearing. So let's get some examples of this. Uh, this is no reverb and delay. Sometimes you need to play Freebird. Sometimes you just need to add reverb. So that has no reverb and delay. That was that was uh, recorded in my closet, uh, surrounded by clothes and uh, 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 an audio um, uh, isolation booth to try to get as little room ambiance as possible. So it just sounds dead. It's also clean. We can do whatever we want with it. So now let's go ahead and add some light room reverb. Sometimes you need to play Freebird. Sometimes you just need to add reverb just a little touch to it it sounds like it's a bigger space i don't sound like i'm in a closet let's go to a heavy reverb something big a huge room sometimes you need to play freebird sometimes you just need to add reverb so now i'm in like a large tank at this point it's a big space it's the exact same audio all we've done is shape the sound to give us a different uh, a different feel with reverb, you get a bit more of a natural sound. You'll notice that it feels like we're in different spaces. With delay, we can create very cool effects and oftentimes do this live that are also going to give us, again, a bit of an artificial feel to it. So you remember what the reverb sounded like? I was in a big room. Now let's see what delay would sound like if we're trying to double my sound, for example. There's two of me giving a presentation. Here we go. Sometimes, Sometimes you, you need, need to play, play Freebird. Bird. 
Sometimes you just need to add reverb. That little subtle change where it's not necessarily that the second person is an echo, but that it's me being delayed. <laughs> it is a little spooky. Um, that you just have that little bit of delay. You can tell that there is an artificial nature to it that with reverb, we may not usually have to deal with. So if you want to change the size of your dome to the ear, reverb would be the way to do that. You want to sound like an alien? Delay is the way to go. That's going to give you a little bit more clarity on how the, the words come out. It was a little bit clearer. The reverb makes it sound a little bit bigger. And now we get to the mix. So you've got your enhancements. Some of the stuff you might have uh, in, in effect processors before you get to your mixer. Sometimes it's in the mixer. Uh, we'll, we'll show this one in particular. So this is the same... Uh, this is the same mixer that I used to record all of this. Um, similar to ones that, that most of you might have access to in your domes. Uh, you might have one that's small. You might have one that's much, much bigger. But now we've got to get things sounding right. How do we set our levels and make sure that the sound is, is, is as uh, consistent as possible? First thing we got to do uh, is not take everything to 11. Like Spinal Tap had a great idea. But going to 11 means you have zero control over anything that happens. All you can do is roll it down. And unlike, um, you know, a British rock band, we need to have a bit more control over our sound. And that's where setting our levels on our mixers becomes so important. First thing you want to do, I'm looking at this mixer. I've plugged in my microphones. I am absolutely going to run. I'm going to click that low cut filter button and get rid of those frequencies. In this case, they've got a low cut of about 100 hertz. That's totally fine for us. If that's too much bass that's been cut, we'll add a little bit with the equalizer. But that means that the vast majority of the bass frequencies for my vocals that are going to be a problem for my system have been cut already. Then we need to set our gain. How much, how much, how much output are we actually getting here? And, and what you want to do in this sort of situation, you've got your channel gain there at the beginning. So you, there's a, a U. U stands for unity. And that's where it's not adding or subtracting anything. That's where you want to start. You've got your equalizer. In this case, a high, a mid, and a low. And then you have your channel lever. In a larger mixer, this would be a fader, the ones that go up and down, of course. And if you want to set this, you've plugged in your mic and... Over on the right side, you see those little meters. They're important. They're not just there to cover up because they're a light leak in the dome. We've all been there. We all know it. They are important to the audio process. And when you plug in your mic, what you'd want to do is start talking into it. Say it's a good dynamic mic. And raise the channel gain until those bars in your main meters get to right about uh, zero or negative three. You want to be in the green area. And that means that you have a lot of gain, you have a lot of signal while minimizing the amount of noise. Your microphone is not going to be competing with the surrounding sounds. And once that's in, in place, then our channel levels can be set appropriately. So what I would usually do in this situation, turn your channel level there at the bottom to you so that you can go up and down. Start talking into your mic and get that gain until you've got the, the, the appropriate part in the meter. You want to be loud in this situation because you want your peak to not go into the red. A peak in the red means you've distorted, you've overdrived. It sounds terrible. It's dangerous to your speakers. And we want to ensure that we have our sound below that. So set your channel level so it's right in the middle, zero or U. Change your gain until those main meters are right about zero, and now you're set. So if you need a little boost, you turn the channel level up. You want to cut it back, turn that channel level down. Once you've set your meters, and Brian, you bring up an excellent point. Once you've, you've set your meters, black electrical tape goes on back on top because those suckers, incredibly bright. So now that you've got that little, uh, you know, a, a quick uh, uh, refresher on, on connections uh, and what you need to know about all of that, um, there are audio cables, of course, that, that give a, a, an actual audio signal. XLR, speak on goes in the back of your speakers. The TS and the TRS are your unbalanced and balanced uh, cables. 
and XLR and TRS, balanced cables. You can run over very long distances, and because they're able to reject interference as an inherent part of their design, you're gonna get better sound quality. So whenever you have a chance, lean on XLR and TRS connections. They're gonna give you the best sound. Might be a little more expensive than others, but that's going to be uh, time and time again. You can run, an, you can run a, a, a microphone cable 300 feet and still be able to use it effectively. But if you have an RCA cable, like the, uh, uh, what you see there in the middle, RCA cables have an effective run of about six feet. And so you wanna use these, these balanced, low impedance cables uh, to be able to get the best sound quality from your, your dome. Michael, you got about five minutes left. Perfect. We are right on with that. Uh, and then that brings us to our, our last part, and that's about the speakers in the dome. Um, you all know how, how domes work. For those of you who work in, um, in fixed domes, the vast majority of domes today are perforated. And there's a good reason for that. Back in the 1970s, when IMAX was, was uh, generating the, the um, perforated screen theaters, the Omnimax and such, they determined that a 23% void that these little holes are 23% of the total panel surface area. The 23% was the best for both visual and audio quality, that it let through enough of the audio frequencies to not really be a problem. One of the things we, we learned very quickly in our planetariums is that if you have speakers behind your dome, low frequencies come through very well, high frequencies are attenuated. And that's what happens anytime you put something between you and an audio source. It's why if you're trying to listen to somebody in the hotel room next to you, you freak, um, you usually hear the bass frequencies very well, but you do not hear the high frequencies. The wall gets rid of those high frequencies. And the same thing's gonna happen with your dome. So we wanna be aware. But at its heart, the big thing with, with speakers and such is, um, Watts is not the only thing. Like this is a thousand watt speaker, a thousand watt amp. And the, the distinction is uh, RMS, which is called uh, root mean square. This is sort of the baseline. And then there's the peak. You want speakers that can handle the peak of an amp, but the peak of an amp might be a thousand watts and it's RMS. What it's actually gonna put out most of the time is 200. That's actually the power that you have. And so you wanna match the amp and the speaker to each other in terms of their ability to uh, handle the amount of wattage that's coming out of these things. Because you just don't want to ruin your speakers. You don't want to under or overpower them too much. You don't want to distort them. You don't want to overheat your amp. And so now you guys get to do some math. Um, it's one of the last things we're going to do tonight is impedance. Like speakers have resistance. Uh, and if you have a low impedance speaker, something that's two or four ohms, uh, that means that a, an amp is going to have a lot of current. And with more current, you're going to get a greater load. And with a greater load, you get more power. This is good stuff. So low impedance, high power. Now I'm going to have you do your, your math here. Um, if it's high impedance, more or less current? You can just go up or down. Okay, less, less, less current. Perfect. Uh, greater or smaller load? Smaller yeah. load. Okay, thank you. And then more power or less power? Less. Less power, exactly. That is resistance in a nutshell. That's how all of this works. And uh, that means that, that if you're looking at your speakers and you're trying to figure out how all of that's going to, to play out, you want to ensure that what's coming out of the amp, that impedance, is matched to the speaker it's very easy to, to, to have those two uh, not go in lockstep, and now all of a sudden you've got $3,000 worth of audio equipment that doesn't work because none of it is going to be able to, uh, uh, to interact together. So that's sort of the, the, the basics of dome sound, some of the things you can control a little bit better, some things you can't. Hi, Michael. So I know I do have horrible ears. Um, I know. Um, and so when, especially when you were saying like, oh, this is very subtle, I couldn't hear a difference at all, like zero. Hmm. And so my question is, has there been any study on, in terms of what percentage of your audience is like audiophile level, they're really gonna notice versus people like me versus people in the middle? Um, is there any, any sort of research ever done on that? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I, I, you talk to 
audio files. That's a very that's a very unique group of people, to say the least. Um, you know, it's the people who claim that they can hear the differences in cables. Like, oh, I can hear uh, this cable company is sounds different than this cable company, and I'm not sure if I really really subscribe to that. Um, what what you get in most cases is um, simply the higher quality component that we put into the the um, the sound process, the better the end product's going to be. And this is more of kind of getting us to think about, okay, if I've got the choice between X and Y, how is that going to affect the larger part? It's something that in reality is more cumulative than sort of an individual, uh, like you're gonna wave your magic microphone and that's gonna solve all the audio issues. It's more of when all of these things are taken together, then we notice um, real differences in dome sound. So we're going for, say, a more consistent dome sound or a better dome sound or one that is going to be more appealing to, to ears of all ages rather than just kind of going in there and like, well, this sounds terrible to everyone. <laughs> let's, let's try to prevent that at, at, the, at the barest of bones. Let's try to prevent terrible planetarium audio. Great, thanks. Because I'm just thinking about like, Obviously, you could spend as much as you want and, and spend as much time and energy, right? So it's, a, it's I need to find like the best cost to benefit ratio and the, the law of diminishing returns kind of thing in mm -hmm. terms of how much do I invest in my sound system? Yeah, like the difference between a $20 microphone and a $200 microphone is, is incredible. The difference between a $200 microphone and a $1,000 microphone is probably not enough for most people to, 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 uh, to hear and say it's a, a wireless headset, um, the full system, you could have a $500 wireless headset, you could have a 5,000, and in many cases, the microphone might be the same, but your transmitter might be more powerful or your receiver might have a better ability to, um, uh, to prevent you know, crosstalk or feedback or interference from other signals in your dome, and that's what you end up paying for. And that, of course, is going to allow for better sound quality because you have all of these other peripheral aspects of it that are working in your favor as well. But yeah, it's, it, it's, it's like amateur astronomy. You can spend a little and have fun. You can spend way too much and have fun. And then you can find the sweet spot and still have fun. So we're, this is about trying to find that sweet spot. Mike, would you agree that um, having more power in terms of the, the speakers and so forth, even though you don't utilize it, is better than having a system that's so small that when you try to push it, you end up with distortion. 100% so. Always with audio, more is always better. And if you don't use it, it's fine. It's, it's headroom. Um, the better preamp, the better microphone, the better speakers, you may need it once. And that one time you're gonna need it, you're gonna be really happy that you have that that extra little bit to pull from rather than this tiny speaker is just not doing it anymore. And now I have overloaded it and the speaker cone is broken and now I've got to go buy something new. Let me get something a little bigger at the beginning. Great, yeah, and Michael, that was really awesome. I think like, uh, I think I learned a lot about audio setups even that I can use in my house or, you know, with my DJ stuff and whatnot. Like, uh, you know, and I think a great point is like, with all the information you gave, taking all that information and applying consideration to your setup can help you improve the quality even without adding any extra cost. And so I thought that was pretty awesome.